tomorrow with the Laureate Eating Disorders Program. Thank you so much for joining us today. And good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are in this uh, part of the world. We have people um, from Canada and all over the United States. So thank you so much for taking time to join us. Um, before we get started, we do want to end in an hour to respect your schedules and patient loads. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about who we are as a program and then jump right into the meat of the presentations with our wonderful clinicians. Um, for about 30 years, Laureate has been a not-for-profit treatment program for women of all ages and girls with eating disorders and their co-occurring psychiatric and medical conditions. We are known for our small patient population. We like to say that we are intentionally small with our milieu and we provide individualized treatment and relationship intensive programs. Um, our levels of care include acute hospital care, residential care and partial hospitalization and about 75% of our patients are from out of state. Um, if you're interested in a clinical site visit to Laureate or more of our um, complimentary continuing education webinars, you can contact um, the emails listed at the end of this presentation, and we'd be happy to provide you with more information about those, um, those efforts. Um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our, pres our presenters for the day. Valerie Grogan is a dietitian with our adolescent program, and Rebecca Brum is our director of operations. Hi. Hi. All right. So, you can just close that. All right. I think the technology part of this is always the, the most challenging, but um, welcome to the webinar today. And I will start us um, in the direction of starting the presentation. Um, our topic today is challenging healthy uh, with the the um, in defense of my cereal written by Valerie Grogan, which you'll see as a webinar coming. I'm sorry, it, you'll see as an article coming through. Oh, my side advanced. <laughs> so I'm Valerie, and um, this is Rebecca. I am one of the adolescent inpatient eating disorder dietitians. Um, I've been here at Laureate for almost eight years now. Yes, thank you for taking the second to introduce us. <laughs> um, with your time today, what we want to talk to you all about um, is examining the implications of the word healthy and then looking at how these um, implications can negatively impact actual health behaviors. We'll explore the term healthism, and we'll also discuss how labeling actions as behaviors um, or actions or behaviors as good or bad can have a paradoxical effect. So um, good can actually feel bad or bad can um, impact us so that we don't want to do those good things. We also want to offer clinicians a way to assist clients in how uh, health behaviors might be impacting the choices and outcomes. We'll also explore how healthism has increased the incidence of disordered eating and how that might stem from health-driven behaviors. And lastly, we'll leave you with interventions and practices. And um, with that, I think many of you, I, I saw that we had a large number of dietitians in the group. My people. Yes. <laughs> and I want to emphasize how important it is to have a therapist and dietitian collaboration, especially in the treatment of eating disorders. Um, so that's the reason why both of us are here and um, shedding a light on this uh, corner of the work that we do. So you'll see us go a little bit in and out, and I'm gonna turn that over to you now. So what stemmed my writing of this article um, was an interaction that I had in the grocery store. Um, so I am a dietitian who treats eating disorders, eating disorders are all I've done my entire career. And I think as an eating disorder professional, we tend to get a little insulated in um, thinking that a lot of people share our beliefs about food. So um, in my humble dietitian opinion, um, Captain Crunch with berries is by far and wide the greatest cereal of all time. And if you want to argue with me about that, fine. Um, I will take you. But 
So I'm at the grocery store, um, picking up this beloved cereal of mine, and I'm walking down the aisle, cereal box in hand, and I encounter this little mom at the end of the aisle with her two little kids, and I think that's so cute, kids picking out the cereal, adorable. And one of the little boys says, mom, how do we know which of the cereals is healthy? And this mom replies with, if it's colorful or it has cartoons on the box, it's not healthy. And I'm standing there with my, you know, very cartoony, colorful box of cereal. And she just stares at me and I stare at her. And normally I'm a pretty witty person. I'm quite used to having to stay on my toes with my patients and being able to say what I need to say in the moment. I was flabbergasted. I had no clue how to respond to this situation. So I responded with, I'm a dietitian," and turned around and walked away. And I was really glad I was wearing shoes that clicked when I walked because it made me feel a lot more important. But it just, this whole idea of what is healthy, what does healthy mean to people is something I became really, really interested in because it's really important. And don't be hating on the cereal. <laughs> it's important and it's misleading. Sometimes. Yes, very. So what I did is I went back and looked at the definition, the actual definition of the word health or healthy. So being a huge nerd, um, I always like to take it back to the historical context because we should always know where we come from. Um, so when I was doing research into the etiology of the word health, um, I found a lot of information coming from Middle English, Old English, those sorts of things. Um, I'm not going to read these old words to you because I cannot pronounce them, um, but I want to draw attention to things like looking at actually what these definitions are talking about. They're talk there are themes of wholeness, um, there are themes of healing, um, holy, sacredness, etc. cetera. Um, in Middle English, it also meant a toast, so <laughs> cheers. Uh, but just looking at where this word came from, the definition in the colloquialism terms nowadays has definitely shifted from where it originally came from. And I find that really fascinating. So when I look at nowadays what people define as healthy, um, these things that you see on your slides are things that I've heard from my clients. These are also things that I have heard from my own friends and my own family members who are very well aware of what I do for a living. It's crazy the things that you hear people saying. Um, I think the most common one that I hear is about um, processed foods or organic foods or whole foods, um, clean eating. I honestly don't really even know what clean eating means, like Clorox, it's clean, I don't know. But it kind of boils down to everything that I've heard about it. Um, these four things you see at the bottom, being fat isn't healthy, being skinny means that you're healthy, being fit means you're healthy, and the new idea of wellness, wellness is healthy. Um, there was a really great article that came out in the New York Times last year about how the diet industry has started to morph into the wellness industry and how misleading that in itself can be. Um, so when we're talking about perceived definitions of healthy, start to compare that to what happily actually means in the real world. So on to you. Yes, thank you. I, um, I think it that idea of perceived health in um, thin versus large bodies does a disservice to both, um, both individuals because there's perceptions of people that then don't get treatment or do get treatment that don't need it. Um, and this bleeds into the term healthism. So if we think about racism or sexism, um, healthism kind of boils into that same kind of framework. It's this decision about um, somebody's worth based on this one idea about them. So assigning worth to people based on the perceived amount of wellness that we have. And, and like Val just talked about, we perceive wellness, even though we don't really know what is happening in people's bodies. It's just impossible to know. So it's a question for all of you and, and all of us in our practice. Um, where does this idea come from? This idea that healthy people are better people. So where in our experiences do we see that as true? That idea sold to us? How is it conveyed through our culture? How are we taught that we should always be striving for physical health? That this is something that we always should be um, pursuing. And then how in the dynamics of all realms of well-being does sometimes physical health edge out all the other aspects of well-being? So I like to think of 
well-being as realms in five dimensions. So physical health is one of them, but there's also emotional health and intellectual health, spiritual health and social health. And there's a, an amazing book called um, Health Food Junkies by Dr. Bratman. And he was one of the original people to coin the term orthorexia. Uh, but he discovered that for himself, one of the, the best things he could do for his total wellness was have pizza and a beer with some friends because that was what he needed to keep all of these dimensions in line and to connect socially and emotionally and care for himself in that way. So looking at what the actual definition of healthy is, this is taken straight from my dear friend, Miriam Webster, who I consult <laughs> on the regular. Healthy is an adjective. It can also be used in the terms healthier or healthiest. And let's look at these actual definitions here. So the first one is enjoying good health or free from disease, not displaying clinical signs of disease or infection. Okay. The second one is beneficial to one's physical, mental, or emotional state, tying into those conducive to or associated with good health or reduced risk of disease. We're gonna look at that later. Showing physical, mental, or emotional well-being, evincing good health, prosperous and flourishing, we all love that one, and not small or feeble, considerable. A lot of those don't really connect back to what we hear from people in the real world who talk about healthy. So hold on to some of these and we're gonna look at them a bit more closely later on. So this slide is actually my favorite slide in this whole presentation because I actually made this slide during a session with one of my clients and uh, it was really, really great. So what we did is um, we talked about her perceived definition of healthy going against what I actually view as healthy from Marian Webster. So what we did in this exercise was um, I wrote the word health or healthy on a big piece of paper and I set it in front of her and asked her to focus on that. And I said, tell me something that's healthy. And the first thing she said was low sugar. And I said, okay, I'm gonna counter with, it means free of disease or infection. The next thing she said was low fat. And I said, oh, well, I would say no symptoms of illness. High protein came into play. She's an athlete. A lot of her coaches tell her to eat more protein. And I said, conducive to a state of good health. She then was starting to kind of catch on and said, natural, better than, not bad. Me, of course, countering. The last thing she said was, it's good for you. And I responded with, it's good for you. And that really was very powerful for her because it was she was able to see we're both trying to get to the same end goal, doing what's good for you. But our definitions of good for you are different. And how we go about defining those are very different. And they come from different states. Um, this is something I found really useful doing with this particular client. I would highly recommend if you have someone who does struggle with the idea of health, maybe do this too. Um, it, was, it was a really great session with her. Yeah. And I think that it's so important that we have an understanding of our beliefs because beliefs can absolutely impact health. So these are some of my favorite studies and Aliyah Crum is from Stanford University and she studies how health beliefs impact um, total well-being. And so I've shared a couple of my favorite ones here. Um, one is the housekeeper exercise study and she wanted to study exercise and um, exercise and the placebo effect. So how she did this was she took um, a group of housekeepers and this was her job, their profession, and she separated them out into two groups. Now, both groups rated themselves as getting little to no exercise in their daily life. And um, many of them had negative connotations about work, some feelings of frustration, little time for what they did, little appreciation for it. Uh, and then of the two groups, she took one and shared the Sur Surgeon General's recommendations uh, for physical activity, and they found that they were by far meeting those expectations and exceeding them. And so the group that had that initial information shared um, right away, they very quickly started to realize true health benefits in many of those domains. So for example, they dropped 10 points in their systolic blood pressure just from the change in their belief alone. So no change in physical activity, but the belief or the understanding that they were meeting this expectation, this um, guidance for health, this recommendation for health, just changing that 
had impacts on their physical health. And also they started to view themselves in a more positive way. They started to see themselves, um, they started to change in their body image and feel better about their bodies. So this is a, such a powerful example of how our beliefs alone can impact our body without even any, any um, behavioral change. And the study here at the bottom, the perceived physical activity study, um, also paints a similar picture. So in the early 1980s, uh, individuals were asked to rate their level of exercise as compared to their peers. And so this alone, they either did more exercise, um, a, a little more, a lot more, um, the same amount, or a little less, or a lot less. And this rating that they gave themselves, even when controlled of the for the actual amount of exercise that people were doing, predicted mortality 30 years later. So they may have been exercising the exact same amount as people, but if they perceive themselves as exercising far less, their chances of mortality increase significantly in that amount of time. That's crazy. Isn't that wild? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. Um, a, another study by Aaliyah Crum uh, has to do more with intake. Um, and, and I find it fascinating how she's looked at all these realms that we consider wellness and has really taken them to task. So in this study, um, the researchers took a group of people and explained to them that they would be testing milkshakes um, for a hospital setting. Love a good milkshake. Yes, right. And and I know we do boosts and things like that, so we all are, are familiar with that. But um, they were told that they were going to be testing two milkshakes, and one milkshake was intended um, to be a, a light option for people, light fit, healthy option, and the other milkshake they were explained to. Um, was a an indulgent kind of um, meant to put weight on the body or put um, thank you. put weight on the body or to um, to be a, a really dense shake for for people. And then what they did, um, they measured these at two sets of time, and then they hooked uh, participants up to an IV and measured ghrelin in their blood. And so just a, a quick snapshot: ghrelin is a neuropeptide that stimulates hunger, stimulates a drive for food. And as it's it's sending out the signal that more food is needed, it also slows the metabolism. Um, so once we start to fill up, ghrelin decreases. We no longer need it. So what they found was that when people believed that they were eating the indulgent, um, delicious, rich milkshake, the amount of ghrelin in their body was three times the amount with that indulgent milkshake. The body didn't send the same signal with the light and fit milkshake, even though it was the exact same milkshake. So even the body's expectation led what was happening in it. And um, I watched an interview with uh, Dr. Crum, and she said she expected the exact opposite, that when she, that um, bodies would respond with this higher hormone when it was the lighter option because people would feel good about what they were eating. But she concluded from that that when people felt deprived, that they, their bodies knew that and they responded in such a way. Uh, another one of my favorite researchers, Dr. Linda Bacon, has done a lot of research on uh, the impact of socioeconomic factors on health. So things like where we live, what we have access to, um, what grocery stores are in our vicinity. Um, and she says that only 25% of our total health can be within the realm of what we would say is controllable. So diet, exercise, all those things that are so preached in our culture. And she says beyond socioeconomic factors, weight stigma, um, biases, access to care have so much more of an impact on our total um, snapshot of wellness. She even references a study, which I wasn't able to pull for you, but I, I, it is in the Body Respect book that she has. Um, another mortality predictor uh, is 
the discrepancy between the weight that you are and the weight that you believe you should be, the larger that is, even controlled for weight that you actually are, is a predictor of mortality. So there's, I share these things because there's so much that we don't fully understand about wellness. When we lock into just a cultural belief, we really miss the total picture. For sure. I also am, I'm, you're, you're a nerdy dietitian and I'm a nerdy therapist. <laughs> I'm um, really intrigued by human behavior and why we do the things that we do. And so this is very fascinating to me, how psychological deprivation almost immediately makes us want the thing that we um, are, have said that we're no longer allowed to have. So Fritz Heider conceptualizes this perfectly. It says, the moment you banish food, it paradoxically builds up a craving life of its own that gets stronger with each diet and builds more momentum as the deprivation deepens. I also like, and this, this can go a long way with clients, um, referencing the white bear syndrome. So for those of you that don't know what that is, you can think of anything in the world. Anything is on the table for you to think about except for a white bear. Please, the only thing you cannot think about is a white bear. What is everybody picturing right now, even trying not to think of a white bear? So by planting the idea that we can't have something, it actually implants it into our brain. And when we say that something is restricted from us, it sets it up to no longer be just neutral. It becomes something that's extra special. This can be seen in a lot of different ways. So by saying, um, I'm not allowed to have this thing. So I see this a lot on Halloween from people. Um, Old turkey. Yeah, right. I, I'm, I'm not allowed to have this. I, um, I have all, all this access to Halloween candy right now. Um, I'm not allowed, but I'm going to have it tonight. And now I'm going to have all of it because I'm, it's never happening again. I will mm -hmm. never have this again. And that is somewhat similar to this last supper eating. Uh, well, tomorrow. Tomorrow is when I'm going to start living all these impossible rules. So today I'm going to I'm going to really fill up the tank because it's never happening again. Also, the what the hell effect is this idea that um, well, I already screwed up my my rigid rules that nobody could follow. Um, I'm a failure. I suck at life. So what the hell? I'm just going to completely dive into things that don't make me feel good. And all of these are phenomena of the seesaw syndrome. So the idea that the longer foods are prohibited, the more seductive or enticing they become. The millennials would call it the YOLO effect. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> and I, both Val and I really um, ascribe to this idea of the river of well-being. Uh, the, the path of well-being runs through the middles, very similar to what you see here in the picture. Um, and on the banks are a bank of rigidity and a bank of chaos. And sometimes what people can do is instead of flowing through the middle, which is balance, which is a little bit of both, um, they bounce off the banks of chaos and rigidity. So they're ping, 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 ping. And being on either bank does that seesaw syndrome. Uh, so being on the bank of rigidity is just building up momentum to be on the bank of chaos. And so if we want to run through the middle, and that's where we find well-being. So now we're going to get into the actual defense of my core cereal. Did you guys know that Captain Crunch actually had a name? His name is Horatio. Isn't that great? But poor <laughs> Horatio. Know <laughs> I know, good things I learned in this research. So let's break down each individual definition of healthy. Um, in doing this, I have found that I've really changed the way that I talk about healthy in my sessions. Um, so hopefully this will help you guys out too as well. So looking at the first part of the definition, it says enjoying good health, free from disease, or not displaying clinical signs of disease or infection. When I open my box of Captain Crunch Berries, I have examined it very thoroughly, and I don't see any signs of infection or disease um, because it's not alive. Um, food, food is not living. Now, food could have once been living, plants, animals, etc. But as soon as it becomes food, it is not alive. Um, so looking at the definition of what life is, 
Um, I won't subject you to the Star Trek definition of life. I'm really very nerdy, <laughs> but we'll leave Star Trek out of it. But looking at the seven criteria you have to meet for life, living things maintain homeostasis. They have different levels of organization. Um, that means like different uh, organ systems, those sorts of things. I had to look that one up. Um, living things reproduce, they grow, they use energy, they respond to stimuli, and they adapt to their environment. Now, when my Captain Crunch with Berries was a plant, it probably was doing all of those things. Um, but if I put Captain Crunch with Berries just in a bowl on the table, it's not going to display any of these things. Maybe a homeostasis, but because it's not changing, it's just there. Mm -hmm. So it's not meeting any of the definitions for life. So when I look at, is my cereal enjoying good health? No, because it's not living. Is it free from disease? I guess. It's not displaying any signs of disease or infection. But then as one of my <laughs> astute patients pointed out to me, people can get sick from eating foods. So I included a little doodle about that. Foodborne illnesses. Really, most of the foodborne illnesses come from outside uh, factors, such as infection from a disease, parasites, etc. Unless you're looking at a food item that does contain harmful toxins, um, mushrooms, uncooked beans, those sorts of things. And of course, none of this applies if you're allergic to the food. Like if you're allergic to Captain Crunch with berries, please don't eat it. You will get sick and you will not be healthy, obviously. Looking at the second definition of healthy, this is beneficial to one's physical, mental, or emotional state, conducive to or associated with good health or reduced risk of disease. So let's look at the actual definition of disease then. Disease is a noun. Um, it's a condition of the living animal or plant body or one of its parts that impairs normal functioning and is typically manifested by distinguishing signs and symptoms. When we're looking at health as a term to affect disease, we need to remember what kind of diseases it is we're talking about. Um, as eating disorder professionals, we know that mental illnesses are a disease. Um, they might have different symptoms than diabetes or kidney disease or whatever, but it is still a disease. And we don't need to judge a mental illness like an eating disorder on the same criteria that we do cardiac disease or something. So we know that eating disorders don't follow the same rules as other diseases. Um, I have had tons and tons and tons of clients who come from families where a parent has a disease and they have to watch their sugar intake or their salt intake or whatever. And that rule becomes incorporated into the eating disorder and people judge what is right for them eating based off of something that they were never meant to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I have this one client I worked with for a very long time from Florida. And she had looked up the ADA, um, the American Diabetes Association. She had looked up um, requirements for that. She'd also look at the re eating requirements if you have heart disease. And most of her eating disorder rules were based around those two things, diabetes and heart disease. And so what we did in sessions, would we would get on these websites and we would look at the recommendations she had looked at. And I would point out to her that they were for a 40-year-old man and she was a 15 year old female so we need to make sure that we are not following recommendations or definitions that were never meant to be applied to this patient population um, as i say down here on the last point diabetes you can't treat it the same as you do heart disease you can't treat kidney disease the same way you do heart disease and you certainly don't treat eating disorders the way that they or the other diseases are treated unless of course you have a client with an eating disorder who has one of these other conditions that's a whole nother can of worms so the third definition of healthy is showing physical, mental, or emotional well-being, evincing good health. Evincing such a good word. I don't think I use it in everyday language, but maybe we should. Again, I want to point out food is not alive. And once you eat food, it is definitely not alive, even if it once was. So when we break down physical, mental, emotional well-being, if I'm looking at my bowl of cereal undamaged physically, I guess, until I start to chew it, or unless it's gotten too milk logged and it's too soggy, definitely damaged. Yeah. Can't, can't do it. <laughs> Texture. Ew. Mental. Well, my cereal doesn't have a brain. <laughs> Therefore, it doesn't have a mental implication and it certainly doesn't have emotions. Again, it's not alive. Food cannot have the same response that a living being would have unless it's a live food. And then again, once you eat it, it's not alive. Again, going back to eating disorders being a disease. If I look at attacking my poor little bowl of cereal, Let's attack the eating disorder in the same way. 
physical, looking at a food and defining it as healthy. If a food is still deemed healthy or unhealthy, it's pretty reasonable to assume that this person is still operating in the context of their eating disorder. Um, and operating in an eating disorder means you're going to have physical implications, um, hair loss, weight loss, cold intolerance, you know, the usual. Mentally, we definitely know that categorizing food as good or bad, healthy or unhealthy, especially in the context of an eating disorder, definitely has an impact on the mental functioning of this particular person. Um, I always joke with my clients when they say, well, this is good, this is bad. I remind them that food is amoral. Um, it is not living. It, uh, it's not good or bad. It's like money. Um, money can buy books. Money can buy drugs. It depends on how you use it. So the mental ability of this person to separate, oh, I don't need to label things, is definitely impacted. Emotionally, guilt and shame, we talked about that with eating. Um, that can definitely have deleterious effects on someone because we know that eating disorders affect a, a whole person. You can't just say, well, I'm only physically affected, but my mental status is totally fine. No, it affects everything. So there's that bit. The last part of the definition was a little bit harder to apply to my poor bowl of cereal. Um, it is prosperous or flourishing, not small or feeble, and considerable. Um, the only way I could connect it to my cereal is if I pulled a, poured a really, really big bowl of cereal, like we're talking vat here, great. Um, I probably wouldn't eat that, but so maybe the company is prosperous and flourishing. Um, I learned that Pepsi owns Captain Crunch. Huh. Who knew? It's things yeah. that I learned. Um, perhaps the popularity of this cereal is flourishing. I don't know. Um, I learned it was uh, made in 1963. And the berries version was introduced in 1967, not so not too much. Um, the enjoyment I get out of eating this cereal is definitely uh, considerable. I just love this cereal, um, but it doesn't apply to the cereal itself. It applies to how I feel about it. Again, if one is adhering to rules that limit the intake and the ability to enjoy a particular food item, there's nothing prosperous or flourishing going on except an eating disorder. Um, the impact is definitely considerable, um, given that it has a high mortality rate and it can really affect your overall life. So I, it was hard to apply to my cereal, but very easy to apply to an eating disorder. So um, in doing research for this uh, article that I wrote and subsequently this um, webinar we're doing, um, I found a really, really interesting uh, article that was published uh, a couple of years ago, I think, and it uh, the, the title of it was Food is Not Healthy, Not Even Your Kale. Um, and so I immediately clicked on it. I was like, oh, that sounds like they're speaking my language. Um, and this is a quote that I pulled from it. Um, and I think it's just fabulous. Healthy is a bankrupt word. Our food isn't healthy. We are healthy. Yeah, underlined 16 times. Our food is nutritious. I'm all about the words. Words are the key to giving people the tools they need to figure out what to eat. Everyone is so confused. 100% agree. Way to go, Roxanne. So um, I have made a very conscious effort since doing all of this research to not use the word healthy in my office. Um, I've been doing this for a couple of years now. There's really only two rules in my office. Um, if you cuss at me, you have to apologize to the picture of my grandmother because you can't cuss in front of my grandmother. And we don't use the word healthy in my office. We have to stretch and find different things to describe what it is we're trying to accomplish. Um, just like my patient who sat down and did that slide with me and we both arrived at good for you, we need to find words that help describe where it is we're coming from. Culture balance is one of my favorite ones to use. Um, rational and justifiable is ones that I like as well. Wise, especially if I'm doing a joint session with a therapist and we're talking about the wise mind. Um, wise is a really good one to use. Unbiased, kind of going along the same thing. Um, tasty and yummy are words that definitely scare our clients. A lot of them say that if it tastes good, it must not be healthy. Um, so this is just kind of a, a word bank if you want to use it um, and follow me and not using the word healthy anymore. Um, I'm sure there's a gajillion other words that could be used, but these are ones that I find I use most often. So when I'm looking at what healthy means in my own practice, I have to remind myself that healthy is a broadly used term. And the way that humans have started applying it is outside of the true historical definition. 
Um, I feel that the word healthy has been retrofitted to fit something it wasn't really ever meant to do. Um, I feel that the word healthy is very defined and very limiting. Another thing that I really like about defending my cereal um, is the, the idea of balance. Um, when I first started on this topic and I was talking to some of my friends um, outside of work about defending my cereal, a lot of them are new moms and they say, but Valerie, we would never give our children sugary cereal for breakfast. And we have to remember, I'm not advocating for people to eat just a huge bowl of cereal for breakfast. That is not balanced. That is not a wise decision. You will feel like crap later. It's better to have that as part of a balance and not go to the all or nothing thinking of this crazy dietitian in Tulsa is trying to tell me that you should only eat cereal, cereal for breakfast. No, that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about balance and we're talking about making sure that we can include all things and make sure that all things are equalized. It's not good, it's not bad. The idea of having good and bad is what's wrong. And again, I will argue with you, but Captain Crunch with Berries is the greatest cereal. Oh, my husband made golden grains. <sighs> whatever. <laughs> my husband said cocoa pebbles, but you know, whatever. He's a man. What did they know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I want to loop back in here and um, give clinicians, both dietitians and um, therapists and whoever else might be joining us, um, some tools to help clients in exploring what this push for health or healthy might be for them. Uh, so it can be really helpful to explore beliefs about how thinness or um, fitness or how health equates to um, words like beauty or love or acceptance or if I'm this, then I might be worthy or I may feel less vulnerable to not belong or to feel rejected? Um, is it a belief that if I'm healthier or thinner or fitter, that I'll be more happy? Or even will this offer me protection? Sometimes I see this come through as um, the healthier I am, the, the um, longer I'll live, even to the, the point where I, I just had a, a, a patient reach out and say, um, the doctor told me if I don't lose weight, I'll die. And the first thing that came to my mind was, we're all going to die. Losing <laughs> weight is not something that's going to protect you from death. And I think sometimes that's this push to never be faced with this idea of our own mortality. Also, this idea of um, if I can get healthy, this will fix me. I can follow this scripted set of rules that will change this kind of flawed person that I am, but living is a series of being a flawed person and learning and growing. And it's like the, the saying, it's heading east. We'll always head east. We'll never arrive at east. We'll always head in that direction though. And I've even read some interesting books and articles on the decline of organized religion in our society and the religion of um, thinness or of health or of fitness or even wellness. Wellness for sure. Yeah, stepping in as this scripted set of rules that if I follow, I can feel that I'm good or I can feel that I'm worthy or I can feel that I um, will bring good things upon myself. And it, it, human nature is to have compassion for that. We all want that. We all want to feel like we can control that. Um, but sometimes it's buying into something that's causing more harm than good. It's kind of like the Instagram thing. Talk about there that. There are people, so in working with adolescents, I find a lot of my clients are super on Instagram. Um, I don't speak Instagram. I don't really know. I just learned what TikTok was, though. I learned that last week. Um, and I found that in digging deeper with these clients and trying to understand where their mentalities are coming from, a lot of them are more chasing a lifestyle. And they see on Instagram that well, Freely the Banana Girl only eats a smoothie bowl for breakfast, and she's so fabulous. And if I do that, then I'm going to be fabulous like her. It's, mm. it's chasing an ideal that isn't real. Right. And um, I probably don't remember this right, but I loved it when I heard it. Um, it's don't compare your highlight reel to um, the behind the scenes footage, mm -hmm. right? We see exactly. these pictures that promote or this idea of what something is 
but you don't see all the life that goes on behind mm -hmm. that. Absolutely. Um, and Janine Roth says, obsession gives you something to do besides having your heart shattered by heart shattering events. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why eating disorders um, is that that treatment is something that I love because there's something so functionally dysfunctional about them. Right. That's a really good way to put it. Yes. <laughs> the idea that something so painful could be lessened by this thing that I can think about over here that consumes me so much that I don't have to think about these other things that really break my heart. Because eating disorders are not actually about food. No, they're not. Not a one. <laughs> I also want to leave people with um, some guidance on when healthy mites be turning into something that you would be concerned about. Um, so I say the circle of allowables becomes smaller and smaller. So this idea that maybe it's gluten-free and this person says, okay, I've lived gluten-free, but now I'm also going to cut out milk or dairy. And then I cut out milk or dairy and now I'm not going to have meat. And so the circle becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. The, the foods that are allowed become less and less and less. Um, a, a rigid, almost fear behavior if the rules are broken. Um, so almost reacting, I, this may be the improper use of the term, but almost like a trauma response, a, a, an absolute fear if they cannot live by that rule. A, a feeling of guilt or shame or having to atone or make up for any rules that are broken a perseveration on the, the fear of the sickness or, or the disease. This is kind of another way that um, the idea of orthorexia can present itself is, is just trying to stave off disease. Sometimes that can be an extremely scary thing to witness somebody in your life um, experience something like that and trying everything to do within your control to not have to be in that position. And anxiety about being around some foods. I experienced this in my outpatient world where I had a, um, a young, young girl who I was treating and I always kept a little bowl of candy and she happened to be laying on my couch and her head was down at the other end and my candy bowl was at the other and her foot touched the candy bowl and she was so truly and honestly afraid of what that would happen what that what could happen to her from her foot touching a bowl of wrapped candies um, and it was so interesting to see what a true fear response that was there's a giant inflatable pink donut in my office i keep it in there for that very reason i know a client is doing well if they take my donut and they sit in it and it's an inflatable not real food not donut. real it, yeah. But it's huge and it's very pink. <laughs> when somebody's food planning or meal planning consumes much of their time and thinking, or when they start to not participate in life because of that, that can be a concern. And when somebody chooses the restriction over their ability to fuel themselves, that also can indicate something concerning is stirring. So some of the final points that we'll leave all of you with before we turn it over to questions. Um, of course, collaboration is key. Uh, treating eating disorders requires all of us to really know our stuff in our field and to do a little bit of straddling in other fields, um, such as medical and um, dietetics and therapeutic. So holding that on your own is so difficult. So I really encourage collaboration, and we have a very vast um, variety of, of disciplines here, which is awesome. Uh, I worked in an outpatient setting um, as an eating disorder specialist in a small area where I came, and so sometimes my collaboration was uh, webinars like this, where I just would have to gather knowledge from other disciplines in this way because there weren't those kind of resources. Um, so I will do this later again, but I also want to offer both Val and I and, and um, the clinicians in our program as resources because collaboration is so important 
and resources can be sparse. Um, takeaways for all of you from this presentation, hopefully will be, oh, good. <laughs> we'll be um, helping your, your clients and patients understand what's behind the guidelines that they're attempting to follow. What's the underlying motivation? What's the promise that they have in their mind that they'll receive if they follow or if they meet these ideals? Um, I also really encourage clinicians to do this work because we will often, I know I have many times been the first person who's offered a challenge or a, a shift in a perspective of what healthy might be for them. And I've had many a uh, client and patient walk away angry and think I was nuts, only to come back later, sometimes months, sometimes weeks, sometimes years, and say that was a turning point for them. I also consider in our doing our own work, exploring the motives for the way that health is represented in our culture. Often they are very monetary driven. Um, and so who benefits from the way that health is represented in our culture? And lastly, I encourage everyone here to explore a different definition for health for themselves. So I did this for myself. Um, and what I have found, and I'll let Val share her perspective too, but that if I let joy, and I'm careful to use the word joy um, instead of maybe even fun or excitement or um, pleasure even, um, but joy in my actions lead me, then health will be the natural result. So I think as Val said, if she were to have Captain Crunch every single meal, every single day, her body would not respond with joy. It would be no good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so joy can often lead us to um, natural health as a consequence. I think it's important for patients to be able to do the work in finding what true joy is for themselves. How would you define? I think joy is a really great way to describe it. I mean, I absolutely love food. I have two degrees in food. I spent six <laughs> years studying food. To me, health is about balance. It's about not going to the extreme one way or the other. As much as I love Captain Crunch Berries, macaroni and cheese will always be my first food love. I love me some macaroni and cheese, but I don't eat it every day. I would not be happy if I did that. It would diminish the, the specialness of it, I suppose, if you want to think about it that way. It's a good treat to have, but it needs to be kept in balance. And to me, finding true balance, health will follow. Yeah. It's your turn. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So um, I'm going to forward to this just so you, that you know the resources are on the last page there. But I'll circle back to uh, both Val and I's email addresses and um, Having you save those, and please note the stfrancis.com at the, at the bottom of this. We are lucky enough um, to be part of a health system, um, and St. Francis is our, our mothership, um, but we are laureate eating disorder program, so sometimes that um, makes it a little bit challenging for people to remember where they can get us at. So here are our resources um, and contact information for you. And truly, I mean this from the bottom of our hearts. It really is a pleasure to be a resource for um, those of you that are out in the field doing this outpatient work. Um, it can feel lonely sometimes. So we wanna make sure that we're creating a really wide net to support one another. Okay, we are happy to answer any questions and, and we are um, ready to see those typed in when you are. Wow, we did so good. I know, we must have answered <laughs> everything. <laughs> we'll leave it going for a little bit longer here just to see if anybody has any questions. Do please, oh, thank you. Hi, Chantal. <laughs> Very nice. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It was really fun to see familiar names on the list. Uh, thanks for coming, Krista. <laughs> 
I know sometimes it takes a while for things to marinate. You'll think on them and, and have questions that bubble up. Um, feel free to use our email addresses for that. Uh, the last cinnamon toast crunch I could see a strong argument for. <laughs> However, we've got to get that good berry in there. I also learned through my research all the berries are the same flavor, so we can put that on next time. Oh. Okay, let's see. Carly asks, what is your response when clients ask you about the guidelines for added sugar? And um, my response usually is something along the lines of what guidelines are you looking at? Um, and does that guideline apply to you? In working with adolescents, most of them do not apply to adolescents, especially the ones that are widely publicized. But I also like to pull in the education piece and talk about why sugar is important. What, is, what do you get out of it? Usually the word sugar is kind of a bad word in the nutrition community, um, especially in like how people view it. So I do a lot of education on breaking sugar and down, to, down into glucose. So all sugars get turned into glucose, whether it's um, added sugar, whether it's fructose, which is fruit sugar, or lactose, which is milk sugar, it all gets broken down into the same basic component, which is glucose. So if everything gets broken down into glucose anyway, why does it actually matter where it comes from? Of course, you're going to get different things out of an added sugar product than you would out of a piece of fruit. But if sugar is solely what they're worried about, I really use that to just break it down to its basic components. I hope that's helpful. I think also um, from the from the psychological vantage point, um, anytime we set a limit, it's this catch-22 of well, if I can't have more than that, then that's what I want. And so it, it can be really helpful to work with somebody who um, can help hold that line and explore. And thanks for the sweet comment, Krista. I miss working with you. <laughs> I hope we can share another client soon. All right. Thank you so very much. It's so wonderful to be able to connect with everybody this way. And we hope that you'll join us for our webinars every month. We hope to really offer some amazing topics for all of you. And we've gotten some amazing feedback about topics that people are interested in. Please continue to send this our way. Um, we want to be able to, to serve the people that, um, are, that we're working with. Great. Okay. Hope everyone has a great Friday.